As we continue our interview with Dave Brunn, translation consultant and author of One Bible, Many Versions, we're going to put the final nail in the coffin of the idea that translations can be literally word for word. We're also going to hear how translating into languages that aren't Indo-European shatters the notion of word for word equivalence even further, which we'll see is something not even Jesus himself seemed to see as the ideal. Finally, Dave will share a way forward for all of us in the English-speaking world, away from the arguments over translation, towards unity, and into a deeper experience of God's Word. You're listening to Working for the Word. I'm Andrew Case, and this is going to be a good one. So, you know, as I, as I pressed forward on translation, comparing the, the source language texts with all the various English versions, literal versions and non-literal, I had to start asking myself, wow, does word-for-word translation even exist? Well, I don't think it does. And are the literal versions really literal? Well, they're not as literal as a lot of people think. Many years ago, well over a hundred years ago, in the in the late 1800s, Robert Young produced Young's literal translation, and you can search online and find the preface to Young's literal translation. And he he compiled some interesting lists of a number of Hebrew words and how many different ways they are rendered, particularly in the King James version, which was the only really the only other widely used version. It was, it was by far the most widely used version at that time in the late 1800s. And so, for example, the Hebrew word natan, which, which is generally translated or, or defined as to give, the King James translates it, according to Robert Young, 84 different ways. Or the, the Hebrew word tov, which means good, we would generally say that means good. Well, it's translated dozens of different ways as well. And if you look at the list of renderings in the King James for the word good, it includes nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, single words, and multiple word phrases. So if we're going to call a version word for word, we have to, again, add another qualification. There could be a disparity of 100 words in just 16 verses, but another qualification we have to add is a single word from the source text could be translated, in a word-for-word version, could be translated dozens of different ways, and it could be changed into a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, or a multiple-word phrase. But it works the other way, too. Robert Young also included some lists going the opposite direction. So, for example, the, the English word destroy occurs many times in the King James Version. So you could say, well, what is the Hebrew word for destroy? Well, actually, anytime you see the word destroy in the King James Old Testament, it's one of 40 different Hebrew words. And you're not going to know which one it is unless, again, unless you look it up. And uh, when when Robert Young wrote his preface and he and he created Young's literal translation, which I'm not putting it down. I think, I think it has its place. But these lists of all of the different ways that, uh, for example, a particular Hebrew word is translated dozens of different ways in the King James Bible, or that a single word in the King James could represent 40 or more Hebrew words, they're under the heading in his preference, lax renderings of the King James revisers. Robert Young felt that the King James translators did not go nearly far enough in trying to produce word-for-word literal renderings. And, you know, he, I think he produced his first edition around 1875 or something like that. I can't remember the exact year. And about 20, and he, he had a second and third edition and uh, as he got older and more advanced and further along in his translation, uh, I think his uh, his description of the King James seemed to become more and more scathing. 
where it was clear that he felt that anyone who read the King James Version only and didn't read his version as well were really missing out because he felt they didn't try nearly hard enough. So again, if we're going to talk about a version as word for word, we have to say, well, one word in the original could be translated in dozens of different ways in English, or a single English word in a word-for-word version could represent dozens of different words from the original. But it's also true that one word in the source text sometimes isn't translated at all. And I gave you an example. There are a number of places where the King James didn't include an actual rendering for the word logos, and there are many other examples. Also, an interesting one is in the New Testament, the word for toilet. Now, uh, Lowe and Nida make the statement that in some languages, a reference to a toilet may seem inappropriate for the scriptures. And apparently, several of our English versions, uh, the translators of our English versions, felt that that was so because the phrase ace aphedrona, which means into a latrine or into the toilet, several of them basically just left it out. It, the, this word only occurs twice in the New Testament, in Matthew 15, 17, and in Mark 7, 19. It talks about where food goes into the stomach, and it is eliminated, and you get the rest. We don't have to tell you where it went. But in Greek, it tells you where it went. It says that it, went, it goes into the toilet, or into the sewer, or into the latrine. And uh, the New American Standard Bible left it out. They just translated it, it is eliminated. The New King James also left it out, just translating it, it is eliminated. The Holman Christian Standard Bible left it off. The ESV left that phrase off. They translated it, it is expelled, period. Ace aphedrona, into a toilet or into a latrine, is just left out in these versions. And and I'm not criticizing them for that, but again, they're not following their ideals, which is okay. But I And the translators, of course, know this, but I think it's important for, for English Bible readers to know this as well, and, and not assume that just because a version is labeled as basically a literal version, that it's always literal. There are places where they, they leave words out. This, this phrase, asaphedrona, is included in, in quite a few English versions. It's included in the King James, uh, the Net Bible, the New Revised Standard. Interestingly, the 2004 version of the New Living Translation translates it into the sewer. So this is another case where the New Living Translation is actually more literal than the ESV, the New King James, and the New American Standard. Again, I'm not I'm not putting any versions down, but I want you to it's it's important to understand what they really are. It's it's important to to see them for what they are. Now, along with leaving words untranslated, every version adds words that don't directly reflect any words from Greek. Often it's just one word or two, but there are some places where it's a few more than just that. Uh, in Matthew 1:6, for example, the source text Uh, basically says David fathered Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Well, the the New American Standard Bible added four extra words. So they said David became the father of Solomon by Bathsheba who had been the wife of Uriah. Those four words, Bathsheba who had been, you will not find any Greek counterpart. Those do not represent anything from the Greek text. It's based on the translator's knowledge of the historical context. Bathsheba was not still the wife of Uriah at the time that David fathered Solomon. The the baby that was was conceived in adultery, of course, we know died just a few days later. That wasn't Solomon. Solomon was after Uriah was gone and after Bathsheba and David were actually married. The name Bathsheba does not occur anywhere in the Greek New Testament, but it does occur in Matthew 1.6 in the New American Standard Bible, and I don't think that they that it was a stretch. They're not adding to the meaning. No one doubts who is being talked about here. She just wasn't actually mentioned by name in, in the Greek text, but the NASB translators and the translators of a number of other versions decided to go ahead and furnish her specific name. Another interesting passage is Romans 12.6, the NASB and the ESV each added uh, a multi-word phrase. The NASB added 
eight words. The verse says, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, if prophecy, but in between those two parts, the NASB added these words, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Look at the Greek and you'll see that those do not reflect anything from the Greek. Those are just furnished by the NA, that, that eight word phrase is added by the NASB translators to give a, a big picture meaning over the, the entire context, to clarify the entire context. And the ESV added four words, let us use them. Again, those, those words do not reflect word, anything from the Greek text. They're added by the translators. And I, again, I don't think they were going too far in doing that, but it's definitely not word for word when you add a four word or eight word phrase in the middle of a verse. That's, that to me is not word for word. And this is, and this is why I, I really wish we could get past the term word for word. I think it would be more accurate to perhaps call them word focused translations because those translators do aim to reflect words when it's when it's feasible or when it's practical when it's when it's natural to do so but there are many places where they they don't do that one more example of words adding extra words is from the King James version in 1 Samuel 14:14 14, 14, in Hebrew it says half a yoke and the vast majority of English versions translate that half an acre and that's because apparently the origin of the plot of ground called an acre is the amount of land which a, a yoked pair of oxen could plow in a single day. Uh, again, Hebrew, it says half a yoke. The NASB, the ESV, the NIV, the New Living, all translated it half an acre. The King James translators this time waxed especially uh, idiomatic. They translated it a half an acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow, which again, I understand why they did that. Uh, they didn't do that in most cases, but the, the verse doesn't talk anything about oxen or plowing. Uh, though these words are, are added. And, and again, it's not, they, I don't think they went too far, but we need to realize that, that every tra the translators of every version have added words that are not in the source text. They have left some words untranslated. And this is where, when Robert Young gave those examples in the preface to Young's literal translation, he said, it is clear that verbal inspiration is as much overlooked as if it had no existence. The word of God is made void by the traditions of man. He was, again, quite critical of some of the translational choices of the King James translators. And he was trying to be, he was trying to, to be careful about how he said this, and he didn't he didn't just specifically aim the, this at the King James translators, who, who of course were all long gone by the time he was there in the late 1800s, but he was aiming it at people who would rely entirely on the King James version and not read his version alongside of it. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid that Young's mentality is alive and well today, and that's why I think your book is so needed and helpful. So thank you for writing it. Yeah, in the ninth chapter, I do give just a little bit of history of Robert Young, and I think he was he was very sincere in his efforts. He wanted to, as much as possible, have one English word for one Hebrew word, one English word for one Greek word, but he knew the source languages well enough to know that it's impossible to do that in every case. Sure. But uh, he pushed really hard to do that, and... Uh, Young's literal version is still around today, but you know, it never really caught on as a popular Bible for public reading or reading at home. And if you want to know why, just try reading a few chapters. It's it's hard work. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it really it's is. It is. You're, you're just plowing through this. And again, I don't think that God intended his, his word to be hard work. For us to read. One thing that, one consideration that I think is pretty important that we need to keep in mind is when the original scriptures were produced in the Old Testament, mostly in Hebrew, partly in Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek, I believe they were extremely natural for the, the original readers, the ones who, who spoke the language of that day as their mother tongue. I think that it was very natural, very easy to understand. Yeah. 
And so I would like to pose the question, is the naturalness of God's word inspired? I mean, we know that the words and the phrases and the sentences and and the paragraphs, those are all inspired. Is the naturalness of God's word inspired as well? Excellent question. I don't I don't know why we would say it's not. And if it is, then it seems perfectly appropriate for translators to not only try to reflect each word from the source text, but also to try as much as they can to reflect the naturalness and the readability of the source text as well. Amen. Now, I have, a, I have my own theory of why there are so many discussions and arguments sometimes and even confusion about all the various English versions among North Americans, and that's because most native English speakers in North America live in a largely monolingual context. Yeah. I mean, maybe they have they have studied language a bit in school, but you know, high school Spanish or high school German is is probably not going to really make you fluent. You'll you'll bump up against a few things, but many many native English speakers in North America are in a, in a monolingual context. And something that a lot of people may not be aware of or haven't taken to mind is the fact that English and Koine Greek are both Indo-European languages. So when we talk about what does it take to translate the New Testament from Greek into English, if we are only looking, if we're only looking at what it takes to translate it from Greek into the distantly related language English, we're really looking at a very small segment of the the linguistic landscape worldwide because most languages in the world are not Indo-European. The degree of literalness that we have in some of our English versions is only possible because, in the New Testament, because English happens to be related to Greek. Now, non-Indo-European languages make up pretty much the the languages of Africa, East Asia, and Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, um, North American native languages, and also South American native languages. And there there are somewhere over 7,000 known living languages today, and currently only 445 of them are classified as Indo-European languages. So that means 94% of the world's languages are not related to Greek in the way that English is. Only 6% of the world's living languages still spoken today are Indo-European. Yeah. The, there are thousands of languages around the world, and many of them are very, they're, they're just linguistically diverse, and some are radically dissimilar in the way that they, that they convey concepts and of course God didn't have to he didn't have to create all those languages but he also didn't have to create over 20,000 species of orchids but he did <laughs> he chose to do that and something that we have to keep in mind is um, even though the vast majority of languages around the world are not related to the source language in the way that English is related to Greek I believe God designed every language to have everything that it needs to effectively impart his eternal truth. Yeah. Every every part of his truth. There are some parts that are a challenge, and I, I know that because uh, we have, with the Lama Guy translation team, I've worked through the entire Bible with them. Uh, we published our New Testament in 1996, and we have we have completed the, the draft of the Old Testament. We're working through various checks on it, and we're hoping within the next year or two we will be able to produce publish the entire Bible wow. in the Lama Gai language. So yes, we have bumped up against some serious challenges. There are some things where when we would first start looking at it, we would be like, I would personally be looking at this and say, how in the world are we going to convey this one clearly <laughs> in the Lama Gai language? But every time we were able to eventually come up with a way that it communicates clearly to the Lama Gai people. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, when we focus on English, I think that's one of the things that makes it easy for us to oversimplify a, a very complex process. Yeah. 
because as I said, most of the languages just are not related to the source text in the way that English is. For example, Vietnamese has a single word that means someone leaves to go somewhere and something happens at home so that he has to go back home. That's, <laughs> that's quoted from Mildred Larson's book, Meaning Based Translation. It's on page seven. She doesn't say what the Vietnamese word is, but obviously you're not going to find a single word in most languages to translate that. Yep. Uh, the Simbari language of Papua New Guinea has the translator who works there shared with me the longest word that they have found. And this, this is a language where they have incredibly long words. And the longest word they've found so far is 46 letters. It's 20 syllables. <laughs> it means, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but a couple of years ago when I was teaching translation, his daughter was in one of my translation classes, and she was able to pronounce the word. Oh, wow. But I'm not going to try to do that. Uh, but it means, had he not delivered us. And I'll tell you that you cannot take off any of the prefixes or the suffixes or the, the roots. Mm -hmm. You can't take any of it out. It all has to be there. It all has to be there in just the right order. And thankfully, not all of their words are 46 letters long, but their words are characteristically longer, a lot longer than English words. And I would guess that if you and I spoke Simbari instead of English, there would not be a lot of discussion about word-for-word -word translation. Yep. It's going to basically be impossible. You're not going to find that it's impossible to translate this word in a word-for-word -word sense unless you're translating to another closely related language that has a similar 20-syllable word. Exactly. There, are, Even on a lower, simpler level, for example, in Lamogai, uh, if we talk about word-for-word, -word, we, have, we have the word karvan, that means today. Kutu means tomorrow. Kasak means the day after tomorrow. Kusik means the day after the day after tomorrow. Kusiklaine means the day after the day after the day after tomorrow. So what English word would we use to consistently translate kusik, which <laughs> means the day after the day after tomorrow? Well, we can't, of course. We would, we would uh, just count three days out and say the day of the week. <laughs> yeah. Now, one thing that I found uh, translating into a non-Indo-European language is something we have to realize is every translator has to deal with ambiguities. There are places where there are genuine ambiguities, and even the most highest, the, the most highly qualified scholars are not going to be dogmatic on how these words or phrases should be translated. For right. example, in Matthew 6, 13, you've probably all seen this in your Bible. Does it mean deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one? Some versions have deliver us from evil in the text and deliver us or deliver us from evil in the in a footnote, or they have it the other way around. In fact, they're they're probably I think they're about 50-50, where then they would have deliver us from the evil one in the text and deliver us from evil in a footnote. And some of them don't necessarily even include a footnote, but every yeah. translator is going to have to deal with that. Mm. And uh, of course, in, in dealing with ambiguities, we're gonna weigh the options, pray about it, I hope, and yet in some cases, we have to admit there's a 50-50 chance that we got it wrong. Right. Nobody knows for certain that this only means this. It might mean it might mean this or it might mean that. And of course, we're going to try the best we can to uh, translate correctly. But when you move from an Indo-European language, which is related to Greek, into other non-Indo-European languages that are not related to Greek, there are many more areas that you're going to have to deal with ambiguities that you don't necessarily have to deal with in English since it's related. And, you know, it's often been said that, that Greek is one of the most precise languages. It is precise on a lot of levels, but one area where it is not incredibly precise is the Greek genitive construction. Right. In its most basic sense, it would be simple possession, but there are many cases where it really is not possession. And an example is in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, where it says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. Work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope. Those reflect the, the Greek genitive construction. The first one isn't tremendously ambiguous, but labor of love, what does that mean? It could mean they labor or they work because of God's love for them, or, they, or because of their love for God, or because of their love for others. The, the simple phrase, labor of love in English, is it's really reflecting the ambiguity level of the source text, and 
it could mean any of those three, but I'll tell you right now, it's impossible to translate that into a Lamo guy in a way that it could mean any of those three. You're yeah. going to have to study the text and determine which one is the most likely one. You're going to have to choose one of them and put it into the translation because it's impossible to, to retain the ambiguity. Yeah. And the third one in that list, steadfastness of hope, there are two basic possibilities. It might mean they were steadfast in continuing to hope for Jesus Christ. In other words, their hope is steadfast. Or it could mean they were steadfast in their Christian walk because of the hope that they had in Jesus Christ. So either their hope itself is steadfast or their hope causes steadfastness in their lives. Now, most literal English versions will simply translate it steadfastness of hope, and then you can interpret it one way or the other. Idiomatic versions tend to choose one interpretation or the other, and they're pretty much split right down the middle. And I'll tell you, in Lamogai too, we had to choose one of those two. Hmm. It's, it's impossible to find a way to translate steadfastness of hope that, carry, that it would carry both of those possible meanings. We have, to study it, we have to study it out and determine which one is most likely. We didn't flip a coin. We were always very serious. In fact, in studying this, not only would we look at the book of Thessalonians, we would look at the, the chapters in the book of Acts where it talks about Paul and the Thessalonian church. And I feel good about the way we translate it. I think we probably got it right. But again, it's pretty much 50-50. Yeah. And if you look at the various English versions that, that chose one interpretation or the other, they're pretty much split right down the middle. And even English uh, Bible teachers and commentators are pretty much split right down the middle on the way that they would interpret it as well. Sure. Another, another area that I found in Lamogai that we could often not translate straight across is with abstract nouns, such as faith, love, justice, salvation. Yeah. You know, Greek, Greek has a deep affinity for nouns, and there are many, many abstract nouns. We don't really notice that because English does the same thing. Yeah. Most of the abstract nouns in Greek can be translated fairly literally into English without, without losing clarity of meaning or even without losing naturalness because we talk that way. The thing we don't realize is most of the world does not talk that way. Most of the world's languages are much more verb-centered and not noun-centered like English is. Mm -hmm. So in Lamogai, for example, the, the terms faith, love, justice, and salvation are for the most part going to be verbs or verb phrases to explain these concepts. You're not going to have a noun for love. Right. So in Lamogai, love is always a verb, which I kind of like that because it reminds me that, that love is not just something that's floating around inside of me. It's something I do. Yeah, And uh, not only is love always a verb in Lamogai, but in order to actually communicate the meaning, you have to state who is loving whom. So uh, with that in mind, with the simple little verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, which says, love is patient, that, what does it mean? What's it talking about? Who is loving whom? It could be talking about God loving people, or people loving God, or people loving people. Yeah. And maybe it's talking about all three, but that's not an option in Lamogai. Again, we have to study it out, determine which one is most likely being referred to here, and then translate it that way. The others could be discussed uh, by application in teaching, but it can't be part of the translation. So we have to fill in two blanks. Who is doing the loving? Well, Paul says in this chapter, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, he's including himself there. And of course, he's a person. So I think people goes in the first slot. People loving, okay, whom? Well, again, continuing with verse four, it says love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude. So when, what, in what context are we generally envious, boastful, proud, and rude toward other people, I think? Yeah. So this verse seems to be, it seems not just this verse, the entire chapter is basically talking about people loving people. And in Lamogai, that, we have to say that. Mm -hmm. So in order to translate 1 Corinthians, this, part of, this first part of 1 Corinthians 13.4 into Lamogai in a way that it's actually going to carry meaning, it's going to come out something like the person who loves people, acts patiently toward people. Now, some of you might think, wow, isn't that going a little bit far for love is patient? Well, I'm open to suggestions, 
But I refuse to translate that verse or any other verse in a way that it's going to come through as totally meaningless. A very interesting passage is in Mar Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was being tempted or tested by the devil. And in uh, Matthew 4, verses 9 and 10 in the ESV, it says, The devil said to Jesus, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Okay, now, in Hebrew and in Greek, there's more than one word uh, that is translated worship. The word I want to focus on here is worship. And one common word that's often translated worship literally means fear. And another one literally means bow down. Now, in this particular case, Jesus chose to use the word bow down. So the devil said to him, fall and bow down in worship to me. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall bow in worship to the Lord only. But the thing is, in Deuteronomy 6.13, the verse that Jesus was quoting, it is not written, you shall bow in worship to the Lord. It says, you shall fear the Lord. It uses a different word. But since both words are often translated as worship, it was perfectly appropriate for Jesus to make a word substitution, which really is invisible to most English speakers, but to the, the people he was talking to in the first century, especially those who were familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures, they definitely would have caught that word substitution that he said, it is written, you shall bow in worship to the Lord only. I think he was using it to conform to what Satan had said because Satan said, fall, down, fall and bow down in worship to me. And Jesus said, you shall bow in worship to the Lord only. Yeah. And again, the, the Old Testament scripture doesn't actually say you shall bow in worship to the Lord only. It says you shall fear the Lord only. Right. So maybe sometimes we are more concerned about reflecting the specific words than even Jesus was himself. Yeah. Now, you know, when we talk about translation and all the different languages, do we remember why translation is necessary? Well, God's the one who confounded the languages at Babel, and I believe he's able to preserve the original meaning, even though translation often requires that substantial changes be made to the form. He knew that that would be necessary. Yeah. And as English speakers, we are incredibly blessed to have so many different versions that we can read. And as I said early on, no language on earth has anywhere near the number of Bible translations that we have in English, and I don't think any language ever will. And yet, rather than recognizing this as a blessing, sometimes it ends up being something that divides yeah. us, something that we will argue about. Rather than recognizing the, the, the huge treasure that we have in all these various versions, I believe that the Bible reader who's willing to lay more than one version side by side and compare them is going to come away with a much greater understanding of Scripture than someone who always basically just reads and studies one version. Now, I've talked about a number of versions here. Some, of the, some are more literal, some are more idiomatic. And I'll tell you right now, I haven't ever read a version that I agree with 100%, and I haven't read one that I disagree with 100%. So <laughs> you may find a verse in the New Living Translation, for example, and say, well, I don't like the way they translated that verse, so I'm not going to read that version anymore. Well, if I were to do that, I perhaps read... Bible versions a bit more critically than others, since I'm a career translator, if I were to do that, I wouldn't have any Bibles left to read because I can find something in each version that I don't really care for the way they translated it. Exactly. But I'm not going to throw out the entire version just because I don't, I don't agree with every single rendering. If you look at two or three or four different versions and you see that, that they've translated it somewhat differently, well, that's an opportunity to dig in and ask why. These the major versions in English, every one of them, the more literal ones, the less literal ones, they were all translated by highly qualified scholars. So if there is a difference from one version to the next, there's a reason. And if you are willing to dig in and find that reason, you're going to learn something. It might just be a difference in, in uh, the manuscripts, or it, there could be an interpretive reason. Maybe, maybe this the clear-cut meaning is not as specific as you might think. Yeah. So as, as English speakers, if I'm going to close on one recommendation, one suggestion, that is to read 
and use regularly a variety of versions. You know, sometimes people ask me, what's your favorite version? And my answer to that question is always the same. For what verse? <laughs> you tell me the verse, and I'll tell you, oh yeah, I really like the way this version and this version translated. This one's not my favorite in that verse, but I like this ver that one in other verses. But then people want to maybe nail me to the wall, so they say, okay, what version do you read for your devotions when you're doing devotional reading? Again, my answer to that is, for the last several years, I have read a different version from cover to cover, and I plan on doing that for the rest of my life, and I'm certain I'll run out of years be before I run out of versions, because <laughs> I think around 80 versions were published in the 20th century alone, Wow! and they're still publishing new versions. Yeah. So there are quite a few English versions now that I have read cover to cover. All the ones that I mentioned in in this talk, I've read all of those cover to cover and quite a few others that I've read cover to cover as well. And I continue to do I plan to continue doing that for the rest of my life. Hmm. That's a good word. That's a really good word. Yeah. And I, I just would love to see the church spend less time arguing about translations and more time doing exactly what you said, digging in to the word and actually appreciating the different translations and even learning the biblical languages if they have that time. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that as well. And that's, that's really why I wrote the book. And anyone, I believe, who is willing to read this book, One Bible, Many Versions, published by InterVarsity Press, it's, it's on Amazon or wherever, anyone who's willing to read this book with an open mind, I think will have their view of translation definitely broadened, maybe challenged, and you will definitely come away with a better understanding. And It's not written in a highly technical language. I do have to use a few technical terms here and there, but when I do, I, I define them along the way. But it, this book, it's not, a, it's not a textbook for translators. This book is written for the average English-speaking Bible reader sitting in an average church to give a window into translation from the perspective of a career translator. I can't wait for more people to experience it and uh, prepare to have your mind blown even in some places because there are a lot of things there that most people have never thought about, never been exposed to. It might be a little shocking, but in a good way. Well, great. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and share all of these nuggets. It's been really rich and rewarding. So thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew, and may the Lord bless you and your ministry. Likewise. Thank you so much for joining us, and please make sure to get your own copy of Dave Brun's book. It's so excellent, so helpful. There's so much more content that we didn't get to discuss here, and even consider getting some copies for others so that they can be blessed by it. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help us all treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.